Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church on this beautiful, crispy Sunday night service. And indeed, um, uh, this has been the land of heat waves. It seems we have one right after another. And I um, mean, but it makes barbecuing a whole lot easier. You could kind of have a head start, and so it's great. And uh, glad to have you here. For those of you who are praying about a certain person in flight, the eagle has landed. And so he arrived at his destination about five minutes ago and said, have a great service and please tell everyone I said hello. And so just in way letting you know about that. So we're going to begin by singing tonight. Brother Carl is going to lead us in a song here. Number 116, number 116. Let's stand, please. Oh, 4,000 tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer praise the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name jesus the name that charms our fears that bids our sorrows cease tis music in the sinner's ears tis life and health and peace he breaks the power of canceled sin he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior's come. And leap ye lame for joy. Amen. As if even anybody that could get praise tonight, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of course, deserves uh, the highest praise. And we are, we are evidence of a loving Savior who cared about us and died for us. And uh, we are so grateful for that. We're going to begin with a word of prayer tonight. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we come to praise your name. And indeed, this is only but the beginning of the praise that you're deserving of. Uh, many times, Lord, we confess we like to praise ourselves, like to pass, pat ourselves on the back. And actually, there's nothing we could do without you. And so we thank you for uh, loving us so much that you sent your son to die and uh, that you did this as a, a loving parent who would give their life for their only child. What a wonderful thing. And Lord, we're humbled by it. Certainly don't feel deserving of it. We are certainly grateful for it. Pray that you would help us uh, through the service tonight, encourage our spirits, and we look to you for the answers as we lift our voices to pray to you tonight as well. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Number 94, 94. Oh, I want to see him. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow. Many sorrows pierce my soul from without within, but my Lord leads me on, through him I must win. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. 
on the streets of glory let me lift my soul cares all past home at last ever to rejoice when in service for my lord dark may be the night but i'll cling more close to him he will give me light satan says may this the soul comes also one but my lord goes ahead leads whatever be time oh i want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice when on valleys low i look toward the mountains high and behold my savior there leading in the fire with a tender hand outstretched toward the valley low guiding me i can see as i onward go oh i want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice when before the billows rise from the mighty deep then my lord affects my man he does safely keep and he leads me gently on through the world below he's a real friend to me oh i love him so oh i want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice okay wonderful i have to ask this though this song that we just sang how many of you have ever been in a location where i would say this this song has been sung in its natural habitat okay anybody okay abigail you know what that is anybody else know when this song if you hear this song sung in its natural habitat you would know okay this is uh for those of you who know a a man named uh pastor tony hudson this is a Pastor Tony Hudson song. And so uh, anyway, just thought I'd ask somebody because I'll tell you what, you go find it in its natural habitat and you'll see a whole church full of people and they are rearing their heads back and they're making this sound really like something. So I thought I'd make mention of that. If you have a bulletin, yellow, of course, is the color of the month. And um, I'm so happy to give it to you and tell you all the changes and tell you what's scheduled that's not in the bulletin. It's wonderful. And so let me take care of that right now. First of all, uh, let me make mention of uh, this for tomorrow. Tomorrow is the very first um, class of a new semester for Faith Bible Institute. Uh, that will be at 6.30. If, um, if for some reason you will be previewing uh, the semester tomorrow night, and sometimes people do that, if you're previewing, or you know somebody who's previewing, uh, just let me know, let Brother Carl know, um, because we're, we're setting up the classroom, so we need to make sure we have enough chairs. Again, a, a transition process is going on right here. Brother Carl is, is uh, becoming the director of Faith Bible Institute as we get ready to, we're already embarked on a second uh, set of a three-year course there, so letting you know that. And um, then, um, keep an eye on your smartphones because the postcards 
for the Preacher's Roundup or en route. I was hoping they'd arrive today, would have made life so much easier. Looks like they're arriving tomorrow, but I'll try to set up a time uh, where we can get those massively dress labeled and stamped and out the door. Just finished the poster this week, getting ready for the cover letter, and uh, we're uh, quickly on the move on that. So just uh, letting you know that's happening. Um, Faith, um, no, let me catch this right here, looking at this date here. Homeschool Association meeting with the parents. That'll take place not at 6 o'clock. It'll take place at 6.30. Uh, Becky, I'm assuming we'll do that in the fellowship hall. It's probably the best place to do it. And so that'll be taking place. And we're excited because uh, that homeschool association is growing. And we're uh, certainly uh, happy about that. And, and it'll be such a great help to those that are part of it. So making mention of that. Um, uh, this Saturday, we will have men's prayer. That will be at 8.30. Uh, making mention of that, Sunday school promotion, again, has been postponed one week. It's not going to take place on Sunday morning, the 21st. It's going to take place on Sunday morning, the 28th, and that'll be right here in the sanctuary at 9.45 in the morning as we have certain students that are promoting to new classes. So I uh, do want you to know that that's happening. And uh, then, of course, uh, just looking ahead again, um, on the end of the month, we will have a meal, but it won't be a Brian brunch after morning service. It's going to be after an evening service. It's going to be held at the Sacrosons. And so just want to let you know this. And we've had a hard time. It's been a very, very busy year. And so we've actually had a hard time fitting this in. But we will have a quarterly benevolence offering on Sunday morning. And uh, that is really an others fund. And then uh, when a need comes up, the deacons look at it and at their discretion, uh, they dispense with those funds. But we will be having a uh, quarterly uh, benevolence offering. So just uh, letting you know about those things that are really coming up in, in the near future. And uh, so, by the way, the Homeschool Association officially begins first day of school will be Monday, August 29th. And so... Uh, just letting you know that if how many of you say there's a fragrance in the sanctuary today anybody picking up on that there's just a little bit of a fragrance okay i've got one person i got a couple people and and that is that is um that is eau de roof is what that is and what has happened is um virtually the entire section right here the roof up there is gone and so what that's done is it's gone, the tar paper's gone, and so all you have is tongue and groove decking. And what that does is that allows just enough airflow for, um, for this little fragrance to come in. If I left that door closed and these fans off, when you came in tonight, it would pucker your eyeballs. And so anyway, so we just keep the air moving, we're gonna be okay. Uh, pray for Caleb. He's working extremely hard, but he's working in advance so that he can get that entire section tar papered off before Sunday because his special fangled, more secret, more accurate than the weather service app that he has, and I have no idea what it is, but I'd love to ask him because it seems to be right, says it's going to rain Sunday night. And so he is trying to get ahead of the game. Now, what this means is on Friday morning, we will have another roofing debris cleanup. We will not be doing that at 9 o'clock. We are going to do that at 8 o'clock because rumor has it, it's going to be over 100 degrees that day. And so we're going to want to get just a little bit of an earlier start. And so just want to let you know about those things that are taking place. And that certainly is enough uh, to let you know, and Brother Carl, let's sing another song here. Oh, one other thing real quick here, and that is, if you look in your pews, sometimes things sit in the pews so long they become invisible, and this is that invisible thing in your pew that now that you look, go, oh, I see one, and that is the Brian Baptist prayer card, and uh, it, they do come in on occasion. Sometimes there's a prayer request for the pastor only. Sometimes there's a prayer request to go into the Wednesday bulletin. And I want you to be thinking in your minds regarding salvation requests because we did back a lot of those out because some of it had been in there for five years and, and sometimes um, we just kind of need to 
Uh, we just need to do a reset. And so um, feel free to fill some of those out tonight and get those in so I can add to that part of the list or any other part of the list uh, when we come to prayer time tonight. Brother Carl. 539, 539, all that thrills my soul. Let's stand, please. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine. Tender, pure, and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And Lord, I see love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree, mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see, what a wonderful redemption, never can a mortal know. can be whiter than the snow. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Supplying every good in him I see. Oh, his strength divine relying. He is all in all to me. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He more than life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see, by the crystal flowing river, with the ransom I will sing. soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. reality is, is when you see him, you will be thrilled. It won't be any garden variety. It's not uh, like going to see uh, mama or papa at the family reunion. It's going to be something 
much bigger and something much more amazing than that. Please uh, remain standing if you can. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. The book of Matthew chapter 24. Uh, looking at uh, verses uh, 3 through 6. And um, this passage, Jesus begins to talk about the end of the world. And, um, you know, the end of the world is coming. Uh, there's one interesting phrase he puts in the middle of all this, and I'm going to focus on this in, in just a moment. But I'm going to look at Matthew 24. I'm just looking at verses 3 through 6. Let's start in verse 3. And the Word of God says this, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And that's going to tell you one of the things that's coming with the end of the world is deception. Uh, that is coming. It's coming in bucket loads at the end of the world. Uh, the concept of uniformitarianism with evolution, which, by the way, the, the concept of uniformitarianism is, is relatively new in the sense it's only two or 300 years old. It was not a lie that Jesus told to the New Testament church. It was a lie that came in quite late, and then Darwin ran with it. And so we have that reality, and that is what you find really in Second Peter chapter 3, where they say, where is the promise of his coming? It says, for all things have continued as they were uh, since creation. And what they're saying is they're, they were promoting uniformitarianism and say, there is no God, everything stayed the same. And then it literally says in the scripture, they being willingly ignorant. It means ignorant by choice, choosing to be ignorant about the fact there was a worldwide flood. The world being in the water and out of the water perished. It says they choose to refuse the reality of the worldwide flood. And it was prophesied 1,700 years before the concept of uniformitarianism was even given. And so that is very, very interesting when you look at that. Take heed that no man deceive you. By the way, that's no extra charge. Not in my notes. You can pay me later. It says this, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and I shall deceive many, saying, I am Messiah. I am the Savior. And sometimes we think about this in a spiritual sense. And we think, yeah, we're thinking about Bhagwan Sri Roshnish. But you have to also think about it in a secular sense. It could be, I am Joe Biden. You know, you have to think about it that way, too. It's literally people saying, I have the solution for the entire world. I am the smartest man in the room, is what they're saying. And it says, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And here's the very interesting phrase. After his saying, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, it says, see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would use your word in our hearts today. It seems that there is something happening almost every hour that could trouble a person. And yet, the greatest enemy that each one of us has in this room is the enemy that we see in the mirror. And we can find ourselves troubled whether there's trouble or not. And so I pray that you would use your word to speak to us and to help us so that when trouble comes, we are not the troubled one. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. I remember being in, uh, going through Rock Springs, Wyoming. 
Now, what's very interesting about rock springs is this. There are rocks, and you cannot find any springs. That's one of the things I notice about it. They call it a, they call it a dry pass. And you know what it is? It is insanely dry. And you don't even feel like you're going over a pass. All you've got is um, uh, brown, brown long grass and, a, and kind of a straight highway and lots of wind and about nothing else. But I stopped in Rock Springs and actually I was in a college group. I sang at a church there. Imagine there is a, kind of surprising for me. Find a church in the middle of what really seemed like nowhere. And one of the members of the church says, ah, don't you, don't you let it bother you at all. This is not the end of the world, but you can see it from here. And that's what they said about Rock Springs, Wyoming. And I, then I thought, you know, one time, um, you know, there was some kind of advertisement and it was some kind of uh, humorous movie line and where all of a sudden one person says, wow, this is has been the worst day of my life. And the person next to him, to encourage him, says, the worst day of your life so far. And here's the interesting thing. There are plenty of outside influences to trouble a person. There are health scares. There are war scares. There are financial scares. There are even woke scares. And you go, Pastor, what do you mean? I mean, there's things about the woke movement and those things are scary. Uh, just uh, the other day, I saw an ad for governor of the state of Oregon. And the person on the ad, I'm sorry, but they looked scary. And so, you know, we have all these scares that take place. After having talked about all those external things, I have discovered this. I have observed that many do not need a reason for internal problems. They don't need a reason to be scared. They don't need a reason to be troubled. They just are. And when one of the things I've discovered in uh, just doing what I do and being what I am, seeing what I see, is that when something is wrong on the inside, everything seems wrong on the outside. So we need a solution for something like this. So the title of the message tonight is called Answering the Troubled Heart. Answering the Troubled Heart. Because I don't know anybody that I've ever met and says, I am so glad my heart is troubled today. I have been waiting all week to have one of these, and I hope it sticks around. I haven't found a single person who feels that way. And so let me give you two points tonight, and I know you feel like you're being shortchanged. You're only getting two. Uh, but we, we do want to pray tonight as well. But first of all, let me give observation number one. It is amazing what will not give peace. Want us to think about that. It is amazing what will not give peace. And let me give three things that you would hope would give peace, but it doesn't. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12, and as we turn there, let me ask this question. Is there anybody here who enjoys too much month at the end of the money? Is there anybody who enjoys that? You know, where you know you had it calculated, you had it budgeted, and somehow there wound up being an extra day or two in there. Where, you know, it's kind of like I noticed this scientifically, and this is a really amazing thing to think about, and I wonder about this. When I was a child, I had a brother who, who he loved buying techie things. He loved to do it. 
Then he loved to throw them away, but he loved to buy techie things. And one time he bought a complete weather station, and he bought a barograph, and he bought a thermograph, and he bought a Sager weathercaster, and he bought an anemometer, and he bought a weather radio, and he bought the whole shoot and match. And I found it just so amazing. I'd love to go in, and I'd love to look at the barograph, and I'd love to look at the thermograph and see how low the storms went. And one of the most amazing things I discovered was this. And that is, in the wee hours of the morning on a winter day, in the last 15 minutes before sunrise, the temperature would suddenly do this. It would literally, in the last 15 minutes before sunrise, suddenly it would go into free fall. Which makes me wonder, what in the world would happen to us if the world rotated, instead of 24 hours, rotated 24 hours and 15 minutes? I mean, because it literally just was like dropping off a cliff, and I were, would we all of a sudden go 10 below zero? What would happen? And I always wondered that, but sometimes that's how some people feel like when there's too much month at the end of the money. They get to the last two days, and all of a sudden it's like they have just dropped off a cliff is what happens. But look at Ecclesiastes, book Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 12. Because there are many people who think, you know what, if I was just financially stable, I wouldn't be troubled. So this is the wisest man, arguably the wisest man in the world, and he writes on this in verse 12. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. And we're saying if somebody works a good hard day's work, they actually get to the end of the day so tired. They don't even care how much they made. They're just ready to throw their head on the pillow and snore a while. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. And you know, sometimes people, they jump over that and they think, oh, well, what it's saying is, okay, he, he, he'll be rich and it won't help him out. But it says far more than that. It literally says the abundance of the rich will not allow him to sleep. It's saying it will keep him awake at night. Are you getting this down, Haley? Okay. It'll keep him awake at night, literally, where, and, I, and I, didn't, I didn't know this. I thought, well, sometimes I'll read some scripture and I'm thinking, it's never been field tested. How do we know if that's really true? And then I met a pastor whose dad died and left him an inheritance. And he said, I don't know what to do. I lay awake at night worrying about my dad's stuff. I thought, oh well, that really is true. So it's amazing what will not give peace. Riches we would always hope would give peace, but it really doesn't give peace. What else won't? Um, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. And many of you have memorized this, and it just simply says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Sometimes we think if we humanly understand it, it'll give us peace. If we figure it out, it will give us peace. And sometimes it doesn't. Let me give you an example. A lady came to a pastor and said to the pastor, Pastor, I have a problem. And the pastor said, What's the problem? And the lady said, Everybody's talking about me. And the pastor said, Well, actually, the problem's much worse than you think. You see, nobody's talking about you. 
And so sometimes we think if we understand something, that it will actually help us out. Sometimes understanding something doesn't help you out. Have any of you ever had an ache or pain or a quirk or a kink or a burble and you look on the internet to see what it is? Anybody ever do that? Okay? And then you look on the internet and man alive, there are half a million doomsday scenarios for what you have. Your, your understanding does not help you. Uh, to, to the doctor in the house, I don't know if this is in your office, but I think it is where it says my medical degree trumps your Google search. Is that in your office? Okay, okay. It is in somebody's office that I go to. It's enjoyable. I'll find it. I'll send it to you. You can frame it and put it in your office. Okay? But um, the amazing, sometimes we rely on our own understanding and it doesn't help us out at all you know we we think it would give us peace sometimes it doesn't give us peace or here's another one and to me this is the most insane thing it's hard to believe when i read this in scripture i rub my eyes and i go they really did this turn with me to first kings chapter 22 First Kings chapter 22. And uh, let me preface this by saying this. We're going to look at verse 20. I'm um, going to look at, just a second, uh, trying to get this right. And um, yeah, looking at verse 29. Let me preface this by saying this. You have two kings. You have King Ahab. You have King Jehoshaphat. And when I look in Scripture, I find that Jehoshaphat is a really, really nice king. But anybody ever heard the term the low information voter? Okay. I'm afraid at this moment, Jehoshaphat, for some strange reason, he was the low information king. And they had a battle that they needed to fight. And Ahab came up with this great solution. And here it comes. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, and I put in parentheses, I have an idea. Have I got an idea for me? I mean you. I will disguise myself and enter into the battle. But put thou on thy robes. He's saying, I have a great idea, King Josephat. We're going to go to battle. I'm going to disguise myself as a Joe ordinary soldier. But you, you keep your king's robes on. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. I look at that and I go, why would he agree to that? But the king of Syria commanded his thirty and two captains that had rule over his chariots, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. They said, I just want all thirty-two regiments to just focus on killing one person. The king of Israel. How many class had kingly robes on? Just one. Jehoshaphat, who for some reason, when Ahab and Jehoshaphat sought together, this is a great solution. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, surely it is the king of Israel, and they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. Now I'll give you the rest of the story, and the rest of the story is this. When Jehoshaphat cried out, he goes, that's not the cry of Ahab. Um, they went, that's not the right guy. And one guy goes, I don't know where this arrow is going, but I'll close my eyes and let it go, and we'll see where we went. And it hit the king of Ahab, killed him, by the way. It's amazing what will not give peace. And one of those things that will not give peace is our own solutions. Sometimes we try to solve our problems. And sometimes when we try to solve our problems, we discover 
that the solution was worse than the problem. So, let me summarize it by saying, do you have a troubled heart? You're not the answer. But God has the answers. This is the second point. God has answers for the troubled heart. Turn with me to John chapter 14. The book of John, chapter 14, looking at the first three verses. Very first phrase Jesus says in this passage, let not your heart be troubled. Well, that sounds good. That's where we want to get to. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. What kind of place is Jesus preparing for you? A place where your heart will not be troubled. And then he explains two things about this place. He goes, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. So, God has answers for the troubled heart. First answer, the promise of heaven. It's an answer for the troubled heart. It's an ultimate answer, by the way. It's an ultimate answer where the worst thing about death is I go to heaven and I get to be with Jesus. Wow, that's bad news. Hope that doesn't happen real soon. And by the way, we are programmed to not want it to happen real soon. What we do is we find saved people, senior saints in their 70s or their 80s or their 90s in terrible health, and we go, Lord, please don't let them die and go to heaven. Then we forget to pray for those that are not going to heaven. We need to pray that we keep those people out of hell. But God has an answer for the troubled heart. There's an ultimate solution, and the ultimate solution is heaven. And when you solve that problem, it's amazing how that can help with a troubled heart. Gave me a huge amount of relief when I was eight years old. Those of you who heard uh, Pastor Mike Mutchler on Sunday morning said gave him a whole lot of relief when he was nine years old. And I thought it was fun listening to him tell the story of his salvation since I'd only told it about a week before. And so, at least I got my facts right. And so that was kind of fun. But number one is the promise of heaven. But number two is the promise of peace, what Jesus promises to give us. Because Jesus did not only promise to give his disciples heaven, he promised to give his disciples the promise of peace. John 14, verse 27, still in the same chapter. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, and this next phrase, double underline, it's very important that we catch this. Not as the world giveth. We need to stop and let that sink in. Peace I live with you, leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. And what that literally means is this. Nothing in the world is the source of peace. Not a little bit. Nothing in the world is the source of peace. I'm constantly looking for it in the world. I'll never find it. Never find it in funds. Never find it in friends. I said that right. Never find it in pharmaceuticals. Nothing in the world is the source of peace. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the promise of peace, it's not as the world gives. And secondly, the peace that God wants to give is not comprehensible by any 
human means. Look with me at Philippians chapter 4. The book of Philippians, looking at chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding. It doesn't say just passes some understanding or, or, you know, just passes the understanding of the simple or just passes the understanding of the undereducated. It says it passes all understanding. In other words, it passes all comprehension from uh, somebody with an IQ of 20, somebody with an IQ of 200. It doesn't matter. It goes beyond, beyond, beyond beyond it is unexplainable it is inexplicable it is incomprehensible it is a type of peace that cannot exist in its natural state on planet earth unless there is supernatural action that is causing it to happen and that is exactly what God wants to give you and me by the way you get that kind of peace people will take notice because the lost will never experience anything close to it. And some of the saved are too busy trying to solve their own problems to find it. It's important. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And with that, I have one object lesson. And that object lesson is somebody going to give first and last name She's in heaven now, enjoying God's glory. Here's the first and last name, Beverly Loturco. Beverly Loturco. And listen, all of us in life have a variety of personalities. And we do, and we have, we have things that are unique about us. Some of us here are more unique than others, but all of us are unique. And so we have this reality here. Beverly Leturco was unique, and, you know, she had a, a background. I love her testimony when she got saved, and she said, finally, I belong to a family, because she was technically an orphan. But um, some of you dealt with Beverly Leturco at a certain period of time. There were occasions, I was going to be honest here, where Beverly Leturco could be just a little bit prickly. I was going to throw that out there. Just a little bit prickly. But not the last two weeks of her life. Last two weeks of her life, much of it in the hospital and the rest of it in her own home. The doctors had let Beverly know you are going to die. And Beverly accepted the truth that she was going to die. And a supernatural peace came completely upon her that is incomprehensible, unfathomable, and it was amazing, and I was grateful that I was able to visit her enough to watch it and to see it. First of all, to see the change, but secondly, to see it in action and just be absolutely, I would just sit there and just be totally, utterly amazed by it. And go, I hope that's me if I go through what she does. If I go through the valley of the shadow, Lord, I want to be like her, is really how I felt at that time. So here is the reality of answering the troubled heart. The answer right here in the here and now has always been the personal God. And he is personal. He, he's not a Muslim God. You know, he's not a God who doesn't care 
or that you really have to just throw a fit to get his attention. That isn't the God we serve at all. The Bible says in Psalm 46, verse 1, as, we, as I look at that verse, and it talks about what you would think of as an edifice, but it's not an edifice. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And we often think of a refuge as a bomb shelter or a panic room or a special reinforced room in Tornado Alley or a, or a basement or a military installation or a fort. But it says our refuge is a person. Our place of protection is the person of God. And that's an amazing thing when you think about that, that the complete protection is the person, and God is that personal God. He's the refuge, but he is also the object of a heart that is not simply in peace, but it is in perfect peace. Looking at Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, now, I was on the phone with somebody this afternoon, and I said, this is one of my favorite verses of Scripture. Thou wilt keep him in, it's not even just peace, it's perfect peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And the personal God is, is the object of the stayed heart. I was on the phone with a friend of our ministry who most likely has cancer. And as we discussed this on the phone, this friend of the ministry said, this is my verse. She said, if there's anything that I want to do, I want to see God glorified in this. I want to see people saved because of this. And I want to learn through this because if these things do not happen, then it is what would be called a wasted crisis. And I don't want it to be wasted. And her favorite verse is this one. And a friend of hers reminded her. Remember the verse says perfect peace. So if your peace isn't perfect, you still have work to do. The answering of the troubled heart we know who it is, and we really need what it is. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look into your word and we look into ourselves and we understand who you are and we understand who we are not, and we come face to face with our shortcomings, and we come to grips with the trouble of our lives on the outside and the things that trouble us on the inside. And we realize in such a great way how much we need you. You have made it clear in your word that the world will fail us in this area made it very clear in your word that we will fail ourselves in this area. But you have the answer and you are the answer. Help us look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing this song. It is uh, 542. And let's stand as we sing this. And this is the perfect song for the perfect moment. It talks about how wonderful it is. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Amen. Let us sing this song for five.
42. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me. Trust him more. On the last verse. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me. Will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, I Trust him more.